Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Jessel Noor in Baltimore, and welcome to this latest edition of the Perry Report. Carbon dioxide is one of the most critical gases in relation to climate change. Emitted due to human activities, it can remain in the atmosphere for many thousands of years. In an attempt to deal with this issue, the U.S. government has formed a task force called the Interagency Working Group on the Social Cost of Carbon. In May of this year, the working group released new estimates that put the social cost of carbon, the value of preventing a ton of carbon emissions, at somewhere between $11 and $221 per ton. In other words, that's what we should be prepared to spend to prevent carbon emissions and to save the planet from global warming. Here to talk with me about this issue is James Boyce. He's the director of the Program on Development, Peacebuilding, and the Environment at the Perry Institute. He's also a professor of economics at UMass Amherst. Thank you for joining us today. Nice to be back, Jessel. So um, what is this cost-benefit analysis? Well, as the name suggests, it's a way of weighing up uh, the trade-offs that we face as individuals or as a society, uh, the trade-offs between costs of doing something or not doing something and the benefits that come with it. So in the case of these uh, estimates of the so-called social cost of carbon, the idea is to figure out uh, how much should we be willing to spend to uh, prevent global warming, uh, given the costs that are associated with a, uh, an unstable uh, climate future for our planet. Uh, so in certain ways, uh, this is an exercise that might seem to make sense. I mean, as a society, uh, we do have to make choices, and it seems like weighing up costs and benefits is a reasonable uh, way to go about it. And in principle, these are costs and benefits to the whole society, present and future generations, not just to uh, specific individuals. So this is sometimes uh, described as being all about uh, efficiency. Um, there are two main problems with cost-benefit analysis, however. One is that everything has to be reduced to dollars and cents. You, everything has to be put into that money measure. Uh, so that's problematic. And then the second set of problems has to do with the methods that are used to pin dollar values on things like uh, having a stable climate uh, in the future on planet Earth. Now, is this the same as cost effectiveness? Uh, that's a really good question. They're not exactly the same thing. When people talk about efficiency, sometimes they mean uh, cost-benefit analysis. Sometimes they mean cost-effectiveness. Uh, the difference is that cost-effectiveness uh, is about how we reach a goal in the uh, most efficient manner, in the lowest cost manner. But the goal would be set on some other basis than cost-benefit analysis. It might be based on public health. Uh, for example, or uh, on a responsibility uh, for the well-being of future generations, also sometimes called sustainability. So in the case of global warming, we might say that our objective is to uh, return uh, the carbon dioxide content of the Earth's atmosphere to 350 parts per million or let it rise to 450 parts per million or whatever. And then we just ask the question, what's the cheapest way to meet that goal? That's cost effectiveness. Cost-benefit analysis goes a big step further in that it uses uh, or purports to use economic analysis to, to set the goal itself. So rather than saying, well, we have a responsibility of future generations to keep the planet uh, you know, within uh, the following range of parts per million of carbon dioxide or whatever, the cost-benefit analysis says, well, you know, how much is it worth to save the planet and how much should we be willing to spend and on that basis, it comes up with uh, a goal which is also sometimes described as uh, being efficient. But it hasn't been set on the basis of uh, anything other than these dollars and cents calculations. So you're saying it doesn't make much sense to use cost-benefit analysis to set environmental goals, especially when you know, you're, we're talking about the survival of the planet. Uh, well, I think uh, many people, and, and I would include myself in this, would argue that there are some things in, uh, in life, some decisions we face as a society, where um, the things we're talking about are really priceless. They're not a matter of dollars and cents. I mean, after all, we as a society uh, ban slavery. Uh, we ban murder. We don't ask uh, what are the costs and benefits of allowing slavery 
or allowing murder. We don't say how much is it uh, worth for the victims to avoid being killed and how much is it worth for the killers to kill them. We don't do that. We say that uh, people have a right not to be enslaved. People have a right uh, not to be murdered. Well, in the same way, we might say that people have a right to clean air, uh, to clean water, uh, or to a uh, stable uh, climate future. And that the question here is not how do we weigh up what it's worth to them to uh, have those things, but rather we say those are their rights, we have to respect those rights, and we want to find the most cost-effective way of doing so. So um, that, I think, is one of the major problems with this notion that everything can be reduced to dollars and cents. It really misses the fundamental idea that there are rights uh, and there are uh, things that really uh, could and should be treated as priceless rather than be treated as if it's uh, analogous to the decision of whether or not to uh, buy a new car or, or uh, what sort of fuel efficiency uh, vehicle I want to invest in. So James Boyce, thank you so much for joining us for part one of this conversation. Thank you, Jessel. We're going to continue this conversation and part two. We'll post that at therealnews.com. Thank you so much for joining us.